started. Hey everyone, whoops, it's Friday. I have this thing in my nose here. I uh, <laughs> smashed my nose and cut it the other day, pretty funny. I was going down to feed the dog and the dog's crate, uh, Moose's crate was, uh, it was dark and I hit my nose and it started bleeding and my wife's like, get over. I talked about it in my last video and everything. So anyways, um, I'm recovering from that. Actually, actually, it hurt a lot. Uh, discount code for today's video is uh, RB200, 60% off my Beato book bundle. I haven't sold that here in a few weeks. It's 700 page PDF. Music theory, it's got Instagram transcriptions in it. It's got uh, YouTube transcriptions in it. My, uh, and then 40% um, off my quick lessons. That's my new guitar course. If you guys are guitar players, there's I think 28 or 29 lessons in it now. You pay once and then I just keep adding lessons to it. So it's a really great deal. And then my ear training course, so you can figure out any of this stuff by ear, is also 40% off with the discount code is RB200. Okay, we go over a lot of this uh, kind of material. I like to go back and talk about uh, theoretical concepts about music, but it's not really theory. It's just things to know to improve your music, improve your ears, improve your general knowledge about what you're hearing. No matter what kind of music it is, it doesn't matter if it's pop music, if it's metal, if it's hip hop, if it's rock, it doesn't matter. Music theory is the same for everything. But there's there's certain, what I say, is, you know, assumed knowledge or so, like things that, that you should, just basic concepts you should know. But we'll talk about those, and we'll talk about some more sophisticated ones for those of you that aren't, aren't beginners, because I like to mix all the things together, because uh, some of the things are not obvious. Okay, so let's just talk about a few terms to start with. Some of you probably a lot of you know these, but chord tones. You hear me talk about these. These are just the notes that make up a chord. One, three, five, and seven, if it's a seventh chord. And these are non-chord tones. Two, four, six, or I say nine, eleven, thirteen. Okay, so if I put my little keyboard here on the screen, this app is called Chordy, for those of you that, uh, that want to know what this is. So if I take these notes, I start on C, those are the notes of the C major scale, right? They're just all the white notes. If I take the first note, third note, and fifth note of the scale, it gives me a C major chord. That's when I say one, three, five. That's a, a major triad here. Now, if I if it said one flat, three, five, I would flat the middle note, and you'd get a C minor chord. If I add, if I take the one, three, five, and I add a seventh on it, that would be called a C major seventh, okay? Now, any other notes of the scale that are remaining are called non-chord tones. Non-chord tones are great. Um, we, we also call them color tones because they make your music colorful. Or haunting tones, I like to say. If I'm on a minor chord and I have a flat six, it gives it a melancholy feel. But that flat six wants to move. It wants to resolve down to the fifth. Notes always want to move to their... Not always, but many times they want to move naturally to whatever the next scale step is or chord tone is, right? So if I have this C sus4, that F, which is the 11th or the 4th, wants to resolve down to the 3rd. The 3rd meaning the 3rd note of the scale, okay? So when you hear a suspended chord, they don't have to resolve. They can just hang out. You can have C sus chord. You could have C sus with F in the bass. You could have C sus with D minor with D in the bass, but it's a different chord. It's D minor eleven. Okay. Now, these non-chord tones are notes that need to be used carefully if you're writing a melody or so. They're also the most interesting notes that you hear. But when you are writing a melody or hearing a melody, typically melodies that are melodic are using are mostly chord tones, okay? So I'm gonna give you some simple rules about using these things. If you use non-chord tones in your melody, it becomes difficult to harmonize a melody, especially the sixth, okay? If I have a C major chord and I have this note, this note A, there's not really, not a good note, you want to hear, da, right? That A 
Yeah, you could harmonize that note A. What are you going to harmonize it with? F? Or that F? Well, that really sounds like an F major chord. So it's not really good harmony. The sixth is, is a very weak note because it does not harmonize well. If you're writing a melody and you say, oh, my harmony doesn't sound good, it's probably because you have the sixth in the melody, okay? You want to uh, have mainly chord tone melodies. I'm talking about for any kind of music that sounds melodic. If it's based on a chord progression, if you use the chord tones, you're going to be safe, okay? Now, you're like, okay, well, how do I know what chord tones are in what chord? Well, this is the whole theory thing that I always talk about. you got to basically know how to build major and minor chords, right? you got to know how to build seventh chords, just like how they were constructed. In my book, the first chapter talks about intervals. The first section is intervals. How do you name an interval? Intervals build, make chords, and they make scales. Intervals simply the distance from one note to the next. From C to D is a major second. From C to E is a major third. C to F is a perfect fourth. C to G is a perfect fifth. C to A is a major sixth. C to B is a major seventh. And then C to C is a perfect octave or perfect eighth, okay? In a major scale, all the intervals are either major intervals or they're perfect intervals, right? Because you have major second, major third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, major sixth, major second, major seventh. When you get to minor scales, you start getting minor thirds, like C minor scale. C minor scale has a minor third in it. It also has minor six and has a minor seventh interval. Okay, so that's where you start, where you get minor in intervals. But the fourth and fifth is still perfect. Okay, so understanding how chords are built will teach you how to write melodies how to hear melodies. When you hear a song and you want to figure it out, this is how you do it. You just know. You're like, okay, well, that's a major chord. Hmm. Is it an inverted major chord, meaning it has a different note other than the root and the bass? These are things that you eventually, as you become a better musician, you begin to recognize. This is a C major chord with the root and the bass. C is in the bass, but if I put E in the bass, that would be a first inversion C major chord, or G in the bass. That is a second inversion C major. Da, 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 da. Okay, those inversions you begin to recognize, right? We keep talking about this thing, your, your vocabulary of recognized sounds, right? You recognize what an inverted major chord like, sounds like, an inverted minor chord. These are important. That's why these chord tones are important. One, three, and five, and seven, okay? You should be able to recognize these things. It will teach you how to recognize chord progressions. It'll teach you how to sound out a melody over a chord progression. If you want to play a chord melody, if you were going to play the national anthem or something, you, you, you can just know, based on the intervals, what the notes are and play them on your instrument, okay? This is why... Music theory is important. This is really, music theory is basically just a way to talk about music and learn music and musical concepts, okay? Now, what are some basic rules that, uh, that, that you can learn or that you can um, gain from music theory? I'll give you one. Here's a, a simple thing. If you're playing a song, right? One good thing is, one thing you want to know is don't always sing the root in the melody. Okay, C is the root. Da, 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 da. It leads to really uninteresting melodies. If you think about, um, that's a tune with harmonics. Old school, right? Um, if you think about Kurt Cobain melodies, you guys know I love Kurt Cobain, Nirvana. Um, um, a lot of Kurt Cobain's melodies, uh, the one I love to use is On a Plane. Um, that's the melody. My video probably just got demonetized. That's okay. Um, when I play this... Hear that? That's the fourth to the third. Da. 
Ooh. I'm singing a third of a G major chord, but I'm only playing a G power chord. So a G major chord has these three notes. G, I'm sorry, a G major chord has G, B, D, but a G power chord only has G and D. But I'm singing that note B in the voice, okay? If I'm not singing, if I'm singing a chord tone that's not in the chord that I'm playing in the accompaniment, it has more power. This is why Kurt Cobain's melodies sounded so good, because he wrote a lot of melodies with the third of the chord in the melody without playing it in the guitar part. So he'd play power chords in the guitar, but he would sing the notes that weren't in the chord. Now you're like, well, did Kurt Cobain know this? No, he didn't, but he knew it instinctually. And that's all that matters, okay? And if he knew it, he probably played the chords and he was like, maybe I'll leave that note out. It sounds better if I don't. I'm singing the third of an F chord. And even the bass riff that he plays, is... Uh, he's actually harmonizing with the riff. Da, da, da. Um, he's, he's harmonizing with these notes. Da, 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 da. And he lands on the F sharp on the D chord there on the third. Da, da. Once again, he's playing a power chord, D. Da, but he's singing that note. So he's completing the chord with his voice. That makes for a very strong melody. First of all, you're not singing the root of the chord. You're singing notes other than the root. And you're harmonizing with the bass. Okay, so you don't want to double the bass note constantly. You don't want to go, um, uh, you don't want to go, um, da, 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 da. If I, so, so harmonizing the root, da, da, da. That's just, it, it's bad. Harmonizing the root, or it's, it's not even hard, or singing the root in the melody just creates what we call parallel octaves. Any of you that have taken music theory and you, you hear about, oh, you don't want to have parallel fifths, you don't want to have parallel octaves. Why don't you want to have parallel fifths? Well, it doesn't sound good. To the ear, Thirds sound good to the ear. So does six. Thirds are very harmonious to the ear. That's why they're good to use in harmony parts. Okay. Now, these notes, one, three, and five, if I'm singing one of those notes over a chord, the other two notes, if I sing the third of a C major chord, right? Da. The harmony notes are the fifth and the root. If I'm singing the fifth of the chord, the harmony notes are the third or the root. That's how you do three-part harmonies. You take the note of the chord you're singing and you add the other remaining notes of the triad. A triad is a three-note chord and those become your harmony notes. Very simple. This is how you, this is how you come up with harmony parts. You just take the note of the chord and you sing the one of the other two notes that are remaining in it okay so these are like very simple basic rules that i would work with bands and they'd never know how to come up with harmony parts and i was thinking like well you just sing the notes that are not that are that you're not singing in the chord the other notes are remaining in the chord i just thought, thought it was it that that was an easy thing but it's not an easy thing actually some people are natural harmonizers that they, they know how to harmonize a melody just by uh, by hearing it. My Aunt Virginia was always great at singing harmony. When they'd sing, uh, when we'd sing in family things, she would always take, you know, sing a third above or something or sing a sixth above. She just had a natural ear for it. She knew not to go to that. When we sing happy birthday, I always go up to the third or whatever. I, I will sing a third above, like after a certain amount of time. Uh, because you want your happy birthday to have a little bit of harmony to it, right? Right, Billy? Yep. <laughs> you don't want to have a boring happy birthday if you're going to sing happy birthday to somebody. Okay, so you don't want to double the root. You try not to have parallel fifths if you can't. Now, yeah, power chords, you're like, well, what about power chords? <laughs> Those are all parallel fifths. Yeah, that's in the chord progression. I'm talking about in the melody. I remember that um, 
anytime I hear a melody that that has a lot of roots in it, I'm like, well, why don't you think about actually changing the bass note, for example? If you have the note G on a C chord, right? Or if you have the note C on a C chord, well, maybe, maybe I'll invert the C chord and put the third in the bass, the E, because it gives a, um, it makes the melody stand out more, okay? This is why inversions are important. Inversions meaning notes of the chord other than the bass or the root are the lowest note in the chord, okay? Uh, by the way, all this stuff is in my Beato book, uh, the bundle 60% off discount code RB200, and my guitar course, Quick Lessons Pro, and my ear training course is 40% off, same discount code. Like I said, these things, my courses drill these things, right? So that you become great at hearing this stuff, and you're like, oh, yeah, that's parallel fifths there. Oh, that's a one, six, four, five progression. That's a six, two, five, one progression. And then eventually you can hear songs like that one that I did that I won't mention the name that got demonetized last week that I analyzed just by me talking about the chord progression and naming the song, they demonetized my video. I'm going to fight that one, actually. So um, anyways, all this stuff is in the book. So um, inversions are very important to know. They're important to recognize and they're important to, to use in your... Um, in your chord progressions because it makes them more interesting, right? So if I... Let's say I'm doing something like... Um, So I'm playing a little um, spread triad thing, right? So I start at C minor. Then I went to F over A, or first inversion F major chord. Then B flat. Then I went to, to E over G, over G, a first inversion. So root position, C minor, first inversion. Whoops. F major, root position, B flat major, first inversion, G major, root position, A diminished, first inversion, D major, um, and root position, G minor, then a root position, B diminished. So these inversions really have a great sound to them, right? So that, that's uh, they make your chord progression sound more interesting. Uh, that's why I practice them even when I'm practicing things for soloing. If I'm soloing over a C major chord, let me let me let me get a let's say I'm soloing over C major. Those are all inversions, root position. Love that. Love that sound. Those inversions sound great against the chord, right? Those are called spread triads. Root position, first inversion, second version, root position, first inversion, uh, and then second inversion. Okay, those are inverted spread triads, okay? Um, now, these non-chord tones, let's talk about those. Being able to recognize what those are, those are what add color to your playing. They add color to your songs, right? Seventh chords and upper extensions, okay? So seventh chord, uh, um, like, let's say we take a, uh, instead of C major, we make... C major 7, well, that's kind of a boring voicing there. Let's say we make it a C sus2 voicing. Love that. That sus2 sounds great. So what I'm doing there, I'm using 
some non-chord tones there. I use like that sharp four, the Lydia note. This note here. Let me get a good uh, thing with the. There's your sharp four or the the ninth, right? Or the the sixth. Major seventh. Okay, so I'm using these, a lot of these upper extensions of the notes, and it sounds really beautiful, right? It's like those notes I call haunting tones, right? Or, or um, color, color tones, they're called. If you use them on minor chords, I like chords like minor 11 chords, for example. Let's say I play this A minor 11. This note is the ninth. That's the sixth. Or the flat six. The flat six is a great note to use also. Let's say I've got The flat six is a beautiful melancholy tone for to use for improvising, for singing. A lot of your favorite songs will use that flat six on a minor chord. It gives a sense of sadness and melancholy. It's amazing that intervals can do this. This is really the most incredible thing. Pretty much all your favorite melodies use these devices and you don't realize it. That's the beauty of learning music theory, is that it makes things repeatable. It also makes you realize when you're doing the same thing a lot of time, you know, all the time. Be like, um, you know, man, I got a lot of roots in my melodies. Or uh, like when I would listen to, when I'd have a band come in and we do pre-production, I'd say, you know, you should change this note to this. If they're playing, if there's an A major chord, and they're singing that, duh, I'd say, why don't you sing the note, duh, change that to a chord tone. It sounds, oh, that sounds way better. I mean, basic things like that. The, and they would think that this was amazing that, wow, how did you come up with that note? Well, the other note doesn't sound good. It's a weak note. The sixth is a weak note against a major chord. But so six can really be a great note against a minor chord. That same note against A major, do, if I were to play against A minor, do, it becomes a cool note. Why? Because there's a beautiful dissonance that's created there that you don't have uh, when you're playing a major chord. Okay, so the interval against the root of the chord is very important in giving the listener a sense of, uh, you, you know, the, the emotional content of your music, okay? If you find something that's emotional, typically the, a melody that really speaks to you, typically the reason it speaks to you is because it uses devices like this. It will use these upper extensions just in the right spot, the 11 or the sharp 11 or the 9, and it grabs your ear and you're like, Man, why do I like to listen to that over and over? It's really because of these things, these really basic, basic concepts of music theory, understanding them. Being able to hear them, though, and recognize what they are, that is really the art of listening, right? So that's why I created my ear training course. And I think that everyone should 
I think everyone should practice ear training. There's just, there's nothing, um, it's the most basic skill to have. You can figure out songs. You know, I used to tell my mom when I was a college professor, I was like, in my 20s, I said, you know, mom, my mom didn't play anything. She played the guitar, basic guitar. She could play Jimi Hendrix songs and stuff like that to accompany me. Or she could sit down at the piano and she could figure out any song. She could figure out the chords to anything. But she And I would say to her, I said, you know, mom, there's, I have students that can't, they can't tell a major chord from a minor chord. She said, what do you mean? It's like, no, I'm serious. They can't tell a major chord from a minor chord. She said, well, what do you do? I said, well, I teach, me, I teach ear training. She's like, what is that? Now, to my mom, this is just like, well, can't everybody hear this stuff? I said, no. You grew up in a household with musicians. This is why you know how to do this. My grandfather played guitar. Two of my aunts were music teachers. My mom's brother played bass in Woody Herman's band. She was around professional musicians all the time that read and did all these things that naturally had great ears or, or were, were very tr skilled musicians. And I said, no, you have to teach people these things. You don't just automatically, you're not automatically able to do this. And she said, well, how would you do it? I said, well, I would start with teaching them basic chords, like how a chord is constructed and what the intervals are. It was interesting me having this discussion with my mom. She said, so you teach them to hear this stuff? I'm like, oh yeah, you can totally teach people to hear chord progressions, all this stuff. And typically when Freshmen would come in, their ear training, would, their uh, ear development was not very good. By the time they left my class, these people could hear anything, you know? And when I developed my ear training course, I did it in the same way that I would teach when I was a college professor and I would teach ear training, except mine gets incredibly complex later on in the later chapters. But all the early chapters, how to, how to hear chord progressions, how to hear intervals, things like that, to be able to figure out songs quickly, that is really the key to this stuff. So these are the basic skills that I'm talking about, you know, to be able to recognize, you know, what the melody note is in relation to the bass. If I have C, and I hear the note, da, I know that's that note. If I hear da, I know it's that note. If I hear da, I know it's that note. I know what those notes are without having perfect pitch because I know the relationship of the bass note to that note. I don't need to know what the bass note is, okay? I don't need to know that the bass note is C to know where the third is, where the fifth is, where the sharp four is, where the major seventh is, where the sixth, where the flat six is. I know those things cold, right? As soon as I hear that bass note, I hear boom. All those intervals start stacking up and, and you can hear them, right? And then as the chord progression is happening, I, uh, I'm i recognizing, oh, the bass motion's going here. It's going it's going from C to A minor to, to D minor to G to, you know, or like with that song that I did last week. Oh, it's the six chord to the two chord to the five chord to the one chord to the four chord. Oh, it changes keys. It goes down a tritone, the bass, then up a perfect fourth, you know. Uh, it goes down a tritone to a dominant chord, up a, up a perfect fourth to a major chord. Oh, that's a tonic to dominant, but a tritone away. And you just get used to doing this stuff by ear training. The other part of it, the music theory part that I'm talking about, how do you build chords? How do you know what key you're in? That's in my book. My book is a music theory and improvisation book, my Beato book. All the extra stuff are uh, transcriptions from certain of my YouTube videos and, and my... Um, some of my Instagram posts that demonstrate the concepts that are in the book. My quick lessons be a guitar course. That is where I take these concepts and I expand upon them on the guitar and how you use these things. Like some of the stuff that I was just improvising. How do you take concepts and develop them um, and use them in your own playing really? Okay. But in order to do this stuff, you have to be able to figure it out from ear by ear, and you have to understand basic theory. How to build a major chord, how to build a minor chord, how to build a dominant chord, how to build a major seventh, a major nine, these kind of things, right? Start out simple, major or minor chords, and then know your intervals. That's how you build your music theory knowledge base. This is what it's all about. Billy, you got some questions? Um, we good? Yeah, we're pretty good. Okay. You guys are amazing. Um, sales going on over the weekend. You want to support the channel? Subscribe. 
I know it's, I know it's really ridiculous. I don't tell people to subscribe. I don't do it in my videos because I'm just like, I don't want to do that. Discount code RB200 here. You can support the channel by buying something that you can use for yourself. You're not really supporting the channel. You're supporting your own music education because ultimately this is what my channel is, is uh, you know, really the, the mission statement of my channel is to give people this information. And hopefully they come back and support it and buy these things for their own music education, to learn about them and memorize them, incorporate them into their own musical vocabulary. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much. If you haven't seen any of my latest videos, I did a video on the most hated band, Coldplay. Uh, I did a video on uh, Auto-Tune recently. I did a video on the most complex song of all time, which I won't name. Um, I, and uh, I have, um, if you haven't seen uh, you know, my latest, What Makes This Song Great, I can't even remember which one I did late. Oh, I did Seal. Oh, man. It's awesome. If you haven't seen my Seal, What Makes This Song Great, where I have Seal in the video, check it out. Kiss from a Rose. Love this song. You guys are the best. Billy, we'll see you guys later.